This is a community-supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at the links in the description below. You might be aware of the reality TV show American Chopper that chronicles the motorcycle business Orange County Choppers run by Mikey and Paul Tuttle. Even if you haven't seen the TV show, you might have seen this meme. In the next story, we'll find out how a photographer, Scott Gunnels, won more than $250,000 in a default judgment against Orange County Choppers. That's right, Mikey and Paul didn't respond in court and now have been ordered to pay more than a quarter of a million dollars. However, how they got there isn't simple, and I thought it would be a good way to explain how default judgments aren't as automatic or easy as you think. I, I might have to take this off. Give me, give me a sec. Oh, oh, glasses. First, let's talk about default judgments. When someone sues you, you're expected to participate in the process. Once you've been served with a lawsuit in federal court, you usually have 21 days to respond. This can be by motion to dismiss, answering the complaint, or just requesting an extension of time. Still, the court needs to hear from you. If not, the plaintiff can move for a default judgment. This means the judge will adjudicate the case based only on the facts as presented by the plaintiff, which usually doesn't go well for the defendant. However, it's not always that simple, especially if you're in front of Judge Jed Rakoff, who has a reputation as being, how should I put this, demanding of the parties before him. I've actually had an opposing counsel be quite adamant that we work things out just so we didn't have to appear in front of him. He can be a bit scary. So with that in mind, let's start with the first complaint and see what Gunnels alleges. Gunnels is a photographer from Lebanon, Pennsylvania, and specializes in portraits. He's suing Mikey Tuttle and his father, Paul Tuttle, both as individuals and business owners of Orange County Choppers. Gunnels is also suing Discovery Inc. and Pilgrim Media Group as the reality TV show broadcaster and producer. Plaintiff Gunnels owns an original photograph, Subject Photograph A, and the Copyright Office granted the registration on January 18th, 2013. This is important because you need to register the copyright before filing a lawsuit. If the infringement happens after you've registered, then you're also entitled to statutory damages, which range between $750 to $150,000 per infringement. Unlike actual damages, you don't have to go through a discovery process to determine exactly how much the plaintiff lost and how much the defendant profited. Following plaintiff's publication and display of subject photograph A, defendants used the photograph without authorization and for various commercial purposes in various ways, including, but not limited to, the production and sale of apparel featuring a derivative work made from subject photograph A, which was published and promoted for sale on websites and on on the television program Orange County Choppers. Here, we see the alleged unauthorized derivative work. Now, someone might ask if the amount that the image was changed made it a fair use, but I'm going to say that it's likely not a fair use. It's not transformative. A picture taken by a photographer is considered a creative work as opposed to a factual work, so it receives more copyright protection. Even after styling it, the purpose of the use is still the same. It's still being sold as a portrait of Mikey. They've used the entire portrait, multiple times in fact, and it's for a commercial use. It even usurps the market for the original. None of the fair use factors weigh in favor of the defendants. Here we can see that the use is clearly commercial because it's on clothing and promotional materials on the Orange County Chopper website. And you can buy the hoodie or t-shirt from Mikey's website. The plaintiff also presents some screen caps of when the merchandise appeared on the TV show. And of course, it looks like Gunnels is being cheeky and made sure to show the episode was titled The Settlement. There are other alleged infringements, including using one portrait to advertise, ironically enough, Mikey's art gallery. For the additional alleged infringements that didn't appear in the TV show, Gunnels filed a separate, second lawsuit that didn't name Discovery and Pilgrim Media as defendants, meaning there are now two very similar complaints. 
Gunnels is asking for a disgorgement of profits, which means that whatever profits the defendants made from the advertisement would go to the plaintiff, although this can get complicated fast. If the art gallery made a profit as a result of being featured on the TV show, and the TV show displayed the poster, but the people would have been interested in the art gallery regardless of the poster being displayed, then is the plaintiff entitled to those profits? It's a complicated process to sort out these details. The plaintiff also alleges that the acts were knowing, willful, intentional, and malicious. This might sound like the plaintiff is trying to demonize the defendants, but there's an actual legal reason for this language. You can argue that a judge should triple or treble the damages if the infringement was willful, so this is the plaintiff leaving that door open for higher damages. The plaintiff's second cause of action is for a violation of the DMCA. Plaintiff alleges that defendants violated 17 U.S.C. 1202b by intentionally removing or altering the photographer's copyright management information when engaging in the infringing use and publishing the subject photographs and falsely designating authorship of same under their own names, knowing that copyright management information had been removed or altered without the authority of the copyright owner. Well, I'm sure you all know exactly what they're talking about, right? Well, the plaintiff is saying the defendants removed Gunnell's logo from the picture in order to pass the image off as their own. This violates the DMCA by altering or removing copyright information for digital files, such as removing the author's name or credit. The plaintiff is asking that defendants be prevented from distributing, reproducing, or displaying the subject photographs, that plaintiff gets all profits from the defendants, plus all of plaintiff's losses, statutory damages, lawyer's fees, and legal costs, and of course, the ubiquitous request of any such further legal and equitable relief as the court deems just and proper. These complaints were filed in early June, and by early August, Gunnels voluntarily dismissed his claims with prejudice against Discovery and Pilgrim Media Group. With prejudice means that plaintiff can't file the case or claims in court again, which is common when there's been a settlement. However, Gunnels specifically stated that he retained his claims against Mikey and Paul Tuttle and Orange County Choppers. Since he had two complaints, they were then treated as consolidated because the film production companies weren't parties anymore. He filed his motion for default judgment shortly thereafter, and that's it. It's all done. Defendants didn't respond, so it's an automatic win for the plaintiff, right? Not by a long shot. Remember how I said that Judge Jed Rakoff had a reputation? Well, he denied this motion, explaining that entries of default are left to the discretion of the district court, and he was going to use his discretion to chastise the plaintiff. Because defaults are generally disfavored and are reserved for rare occasions, when doubt exists as to whether a default should be granted or vacated, the doubt should be resolved in favor of the defaulting party. This is a situation I ran into in the Imagos case. I asked for a default judgment, but the court believed that the defendant was interested in defending herself, so it gave her plenty of leeway to do so, including allowing responses filed late. Here, the defaulting defendants were served with both complaints by no later than June 13th and have made no appearance. There is nothing to suggest that their defaults were not willful. Nonetheless, the court has serious doubts as to the merits of this case. That's never something you want a judge to write about your complaint. Both complaints allege copyright infringement. Plaintiff is a photographer who purportedly took certain headshots of defendant Michael Tuttle. Gunnels alleges that these photographs were used without license in Tuttle's merchandise and on the television program American Chopper. The statute of limitations for civil copyright infringement actions is three years, yet several of the allegations in this first complaint clearly relate to acts taken outside the limitations period. The judge points out the advertisement for the art gallery opening was from 2011, and an ad for a festival was from 2013. In fact, most of the allegations are more than three years old. At least one act of alleged infringement appears to be facially within the limitations period, a Facebook post from 2017, but the fact that a great majority of the alleged infringement is six to eight years old gives the court pause. Nowhere in either complaint nor in plaintiff's motion for default judgment is the statute of limitations addressed. On the face of it, then, plaintiff appears to be seeking substantial damages for claims that might be utterly meritless. Additionally, there would be minimal, if any, prejudice to plaintiff from the denial of the motion for default judgment. Ouch. 
You never want the judge to call your case utterly meritless, but it especially stings when the defendants haven't even shown up to court. The court therefore declines to enter a default judgment at this time. As noted above, plaintiff has alleged one act of infringement that facially appears to be within the limitations period. The court therefore offers plaintiff a choice. Plaintiff may either accept a default judgment on this single claim for copyright infringement, in which case the court will enter a default judgment and calculate statutory damages only for that single violation rather than the six violations alleged by plaintiff. Alternatively, plaintiff may file an amended complaint by no later than August 30th, 2019, clarifying which causes of action are timely. In that case, the court will vacate the default. If defendants again fail to answer in the time permitted, plaintiff may renew his motion for default judgment. Remember before when I said that a default judgment means the judge rules based on the facts alleged by the plaintiff? Here, Judge Rakoff was seriously unimpressed with the facts as presented by the plaintiff, since the statute of limitations appears to have expired on most of the claims. However, the judge is giving Gunnels a second chance to amend his complaint with newer infringements. In the amended complaint, Gunnels alleges 10 different portraits have been infringed in the past three years, but I'll only focus on one to give you an idea of what's alleged. Here's the first portrait, and here we can see it being used on Mikey's Facebook page from a post in 2016, although it was still available in 2019. Looks like there are some promotional uses as well from 2017. The image even appeared on the front of several magazines. Gunnels then goes through the same process with another portrait of Mikey. There are 10 portraits in all. Now that Gunnels has his amended complaint that only lists infringements in the last three years, he files for default judgment and this whole thing is over, right? Nope. Judge Rakoff is still not happy. This time he dismisses the case. Let's see what happened. A conference in the above captioned case was scheduled for January 3rd, 2020 at 5 p.m. However, Neither counsel for plaintiff, nor counsel if any for defendants, appeared. The court thus assumes that plaintiff has abandoned the case, which is accordingly dismissed. The court nonetheless grants plaintiff leave to file a brief explaining why the case should be reinstated, so ordered. This is not a happy judge. First he says that the case looked meritless, and now he's dismissing the case because the plaintiff's attorney failed to appear. Lawyers often say that the first rule of court is not to piss off the judge. Let this be a warning to everyone. Always show up to court scheduled conferences even if you think the other side won't show. But Judge Rakoff gave the plaintiff a chance to submit a brief as to why the case shouldn't be dismissed, so let's see what Gunnels, the plaintiff, has to say. The current circumstances favor reinstatement, he says. Gunnels has, for the most part, diligently prosecuted his case in the face of challenging and somewhat unusual circumstances. He has met every deadline and made every appearance aside from the recent pretrial conference, which his counsel erroneously concluded was no longer on calendar given the defendant's refusal to appear. As discussed below, it is respectfully submitted that the action should be reinstated. This is a good balance of being professional, contrite, and providing an explanation for his failure. The plaintiff goes on to argue that dismissal is the most severe sanction and that he's diligently prosecuted the case up to now and this is the first time he's failed to appear. He then gets into some technical arguments saying that a failure to appear at a Rule 16 pretrial conference is not one of the instances where a judge can dismiss an action and that dismissal is less appropriate because the court didn't give any notice. He also argues that the missed conference doesn't prejudice or harm the defendants because they've refused to participate anyway. He even gets in a jab and says that according to their social media posts, both Mikey and Paul are advertising appearances in January. Quote, such activity demonstrates that Orange County Choppers is viable and that Paul Tuttle is physically capable of attending meetings. He goes on to argue that this type of sanction is usually reserved for frivolous plaintiffs, which Gunnels is not. Quote, the court's own interest in managing its docket mitigates against dismissal as well. This factor disfavors plaintiffs who swamp the court with irrelevant and obstructionist filings. Even then, there must be a compelling reason or evidence of an extreme effect on court's congestion before a litigant's right to be heard is subrogated to the convenience of the court. No such evidence exists here. Gunnels then argues that a lesser sanction should be considered, but since none were mentioned in the order, the case should be reinstated and adjudicated on the merits. 
This brief relies on some fundamental things. The justice system isn't only about following rules. Judges want to decide cases on the merits. Just like the judge gave American Chopper another chance to respond to the complaint in the fall, the plaintiff is asking for his own second chance. Of course, the plaintiff is also going to take the opportunity to lay some blame on the defendants and make them look like they're the ones not taking the case seriously. It's a delicate balance to both take responsibility for your own mistakes, but also shift blame onto your opposing party. As we've seen with other cases, you don't want to fabricate excuses. Take some responsibility and be apologetic. It worked here as the judge reinstated the case and gave permission for the plaintiff to refile for default judgment. Let's take a look. This is the notice that will state all the facts necessary to justify the motion for a default judgment. This was filed January 30th, so more than five months after the amended complaint, with only recent claims, was filed. But we start the clock for the defendant to respond once they've been served, which was September 25th or 27th. It's definitely been more than 21 days. Now we get to find out how the default judgment amount became more than $250,000. Remember, statutory damages can range from $750 to $150,000 per infringement. The plaintiff has to decide what amount they should ask for. This can be tricky. The plaintiff wants to maximize the amount they get, but asking for too much could make the judge substantially reduce the judgment on their own. In this case, Judge Rakoff has already admonished the plaintiff twice. I think I have the perfect citation to explain from the judge's perspective what goes into determining damages for copyright infringement cases that end in default. This is the case of Butt Nugget versus Radio Lake Placid, a 2011 case in the Northern District of New York. In this case, Butt Nugget and several other plaintiffs owned copyrights to 33 songs that were then played without license by a radio station. The radio station didn't respond to the lawsuit and defaulted. Here, Judge May D'Augustino is explaining to Butt Nugget her reservations about granting the maximum $150,000 in damages per infringement. In determining a proper statutory damages award, courts generally consider the expenses saved and the profits reaped by the defendants in connection with the infringement, the revenues lost by the plaintiff as a result of defendant's conduct, and the infringer's state of mind. Additionally, to put infringers on notice that it costs less to obey the copyright laws than to violate them, a statutory damage award should significantly exceed the amount of unpaid licensing fees. As such, courts often impose statutory damages in an amount more than double unpaid license fees where the infringement was not innocent. Considering the fact that plaintiffs seek the maximum statutory damages for each of the 33 infringed works, and in light of the fact that defendants have failed to appear in this matter, the court finds that it is inappropriate to award damages without first conducting a hearing. See Interscope Records v. Owusu. Unlike Interscope Records, where the plaintiff was seeking only the minimum damages of $750 per work, plaintiffs here seek $150,000 for each infringed work for a total of $4.95 million. Moreover, the court believes that a hearing will help provide additional information regarding the appropriateness of such an award and will allow plaintiffs to explain why a significantly reduced award would not accomplish the deterrent effect envisioned by the Copyright Act while still adequately compensating plaintiffs. Finally, a hearing will also provide defendants one final opportunity to appear in this matter and challenge plaintiffs' position regarding an appropriate award. So, in Butt Nugget, the judge requested a default hearing so the plaintiff could justify asking for the maximum possible penalty. She seemed skeptical that a $5 million damage award was the right outcome for a radio station failing to pay a licensing fee. Although judges want to see people follow copyright law, they are also aware that huge awards could ruin someone's life or business. She also wanted to give the defendants another chance to appear and challenge the default process. For Gunnell's default against American Chopper, he might also consider asking for lower damages if he wants a final amount that he has some hope of collecting on. Gunnell's alleges 10 infringements in the amended complaint, so maximum damages would result in an award of $1.5 million. It might be difficult to collect on that or to convince the judge that those damages are warranted. However, the plaintiff can likely justify asking for more than the minimum because he presented evidence that American Chopper is a well-known successful business and the images were used in marketing and merchandising. 
Gunnels asks for $25,000 for each of the 10 infringements for a total of $250,000. This likely takes into consideration the balance between what his license fee would have been, how much the plaintiff imagines the defendants made off the images, the multiple uses of each photo, intentionally removing the photographer's logo, and the ability of the defendants to pay. The plaintiff also asks for $2,500 in fees and costs, and only $6,000 in attorney's fees. As you can see, attorney's fees can quickly add up, even in a case that ends in default. This notice and the subsequent motion for default judgment were both served on the defendants on January 30th. This is important. The court wants to give the defendants one last chance to come to the default judgment hearing on February 13th and participate in the lawsuit. However, it looks like the Tuttles didn't show up and the judge granted the default judgment in full, totaling $258,484.45. Wow. However, it's possible that this is not the end of the case. The defendants can still ask the court to reverse the default judgment and adjudicate on the merits of the case, although they would need to present a really good reason or good cause for waiting so long to participate. We don't know why Orange County Choppers ignored the lawsuit. It's possible they did a cost-benefit analysis and realized the legal fees to defend themselves would have just added to the cost of the case. However, it's common to negotiate a settlement in these situations. It's often easier, faster, cheaper, and has more certainty for everyone involved. The plaintiff may have accepted a lot less to walk away. Heck, they may still be able to settle on the judgment itself. We can also see from this case that the process to get a default judgment can be longer and more complicated than just waiting out the clock and asking for damages. The judge can deny that motion or say your pleadings don't justify the relief you're asking for. This case was complex, so we've done the only logical thing and summarized it in meme form. So what do you think of this story? Would you ever want to be in front of Judge Jed Rakoff? Let us know in the comments below. Of course, with the situation going on, we've seen the amount of our advertising revenue from YouTube fall. This is why your monthly support through Patreon sponsors, Floatplane and Twitch, and YouTube membership are so vital. If you're looking for another way to support, we've just launched a new sticker design based on our R. Kelly Sovereign Citizen video that says, I do not consent to these pleadings. I do not accept this offer to contract. Look for the link to our Teespring store in the description below. I'd especially like to thank our supporters for the month of May. This is a community-supported channel, and we wouldn't exist without your monthly financial support. Thank you so much to the following $50 plus supporters. Joe Tyson, Wes Delge, Nicely Done Defense, Video Remonetized, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Kyle Mudrock, Spirit Bear, Jan Gray, Michael Pierce, Daniel Perez, Blackleaf, Benjamin Hightoff, Stephen Otta, Cute Grills in Your Area, Longreach Jones, Zachary Cheney, Mullen PC, Ugly Grill, Shiloh T, Josh Baker, Gregory, and Rudolph Becherer Jr. And thank you to the $5 plus supporters who appear on the LED matrix behind me, as well as in the description of the videos that drop. Special thanks to Tactical Bra, who wrote this story. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. I'll see you in the next one. Love you all. Bye.